We have to briefly summarize this uh, last section on uh, the respiratory system, on ventilation. We'd outline the main zones of the lung, some of the major anatomy and the, and the uh, components that are involved in gas exchange. And this is to set us up for our next section, which is to investigate that process of gas exchange. We had just finished last week talking about the mechanics of ventilation and now just addressing some of the characteristics at the alveoli or smaller characteristics that affect ventilation. So surface tension was one of those factors that affected the ability of the alveoli to ventilate, to change size, to move air in and out. And normally surface tension would want to collapse the alveoli, but we have this protective mechanism in place, surfactant, which is a phospholipid, kind of like a soapy layer that removes a lot of that inward pull. It prevents the collapse of the alveoli, which is really good because it's very hard to reinflate them if they collapse. So they never fully collapse, they never close because of surfactant. And I showed you that it wasn't that there was a, a ball um, of these phospholipids arranged in the middle as indicated on the last slide. It's more of a layer like this. So surfactant largely decreases surface tension, which in and of itself will help to alleviate some of the elastic recoil in the lungs. Surface tension, that pull, that inward pull of the alveoli probably accounts for about two-thirds of this elastic recoil. The desire or the tendency of the lungs to return to their original shape. That's what I mean when I describe elastic recoil. There's still a third due to stretch of the lung tissue, stretch of the walls of the bronchioles, or uh, the alveolar sacs, those want to return to their original shape after inspiration. And doing so helps to push some air out. Pressure increases inside the alveolar sac and it follows the gradient out of the lungs. So some elastic recoil still exists, which help to uh, affect ventilation or push air out during exhalation. A characteristic of the lungs that we don't often think of is compliance or how flexible, how moldable, how um, floppy or rubbery, how flexible they are, how easy they are to uh, change shape, how likely they are to change shape. And a highly compliant lung is very flexible. Alveoli will change in diameter. Alveolar sacs will expand easily in a compliant lung. And so compliance is a characteristic that we, we want to have on hand. It allows for normal, healthy function of the lungs. But non-compliant lungs uh, don't move air as easily. That is, the shape doesn't change as readily in response to lifting of the thoracic cage or pulling down of the diaphragm. So a non-compliant lung could be um, a situation where there's been scar tissue from some uh, congenital defect or disease as a child or scarring and fibrosis from smoking decreases the compliance of lung tissue, makes it harder and less flexible. And just like we saw in the last section, the flow of air through a tube is resisted or is impeded by airway resistance. Just like the flow of blood through a tube was impeded by the resistance of that tube or the constriction of that tube, the same thing happens in the airways. So the bronchioles are um, structures that can contract and dilate to help divert air to where it needs to go. They're analogous to the arterioles in this analogy. 
And if the bronchioles are too constricted, the cross-sectional area is too small, there's less room for air to move, and resistance is higher. So a high airway resistance would affect uh, ventilation as well. And this is um, what characterizes asthma attacks. Constriction of the bronchioles throughout the lung tissue makes for very small airways, very small passageways for air to move through, and breathing is labored. It's really difficult because of a high airway resistance. General overview. Now let's wrap this section up. Because the introduction slides weren't too imaginative, we, we definitely covered the anatomy of the respiratory system, the major zones, upper and lower respiratory conducting. We talked about the physiology of the movement, contraction of the muscles, the expansion of those key care, or the, the key components and movement of air, and the uh, the events that cause inhalation and exhalation. So let's summarize the main overview points in this section. We didn't touch so much on the upper respiratory system, pharynx, larynx, etc. Because we're focused right now on gas exchange and the components that support gas exchange. It occurs in the respiratory zone of the lower respiratory system. There are a number of individual components that make up the respiratory zone. It's more than just the alveoli. But the alveoli and the alveolar sacs are the primary site of gas exchange. Primary site of gas exchange. They are purpose built for the exchange of gases through the membranes. The membranes are very thin. And there is an incredible surface area. After 23 bifurcations, we counted 8.4 million alveolar sacs and then that to the 10 alveoli uh, individually. An incredible surface area, very thin walls. Both of those um, allow for very easy exchange of gases. For there to be gas to exchange, we need to refresh or renew the supply constantly. That's why we breathe in and out. That's why we ventilate. To refresh or renew the air available in the alveoli for gas exchange. And the way that we do that is through creating and manipulating pressure gradients. Just like on the cardiovascular side, flow follows the pressure gradient from high to low. So if we contract the respiratory muscles, we create a negative pressure or a lower pressure in the lungs, air moves in. If we let them relax and the thoracic cage drops, the diaphragm rises, pressure increases and pushes air out on exhalation. We manipulate the pressure gradient specifically to move air. Remember the name of the law that describes the pressure volume relationship that we talked about? When pressure drops, or when pressure increases, volume drops, and vice versa. Yeah? Boyle's law. We're going to add two more laws, so it's important to keep them separate. Boyle's law, uh, Dalton's law, and Henry's law when we get into gas exchange. And lastly, the, the factors that affect ventilation, there are a few and their effects are varied. They're generally quite small, but I think of those, the most important is the idea that surface tension creates or supports that elastic recoil of the lungs and helps to expel air during expiration. It encourages recoil, but would collapse the lungs if we didn't have a safety net in place. And that uh, safety net is surfactant, which lines the inside of the alveoli, preventing collapse. 
And with this, we should be prepared, I think, to investigate and explore the exchange of gases between the alveoli and the capillaries, which is our next section. Before we move on, though, any questions about these last few details or other elements we covered last week? No, you're well practiced after the, uh, the turning point exercises and questions last week, which is good. Okay. Let's switch over then. Gas exchange, but really blood and gas exchange. To understand gas exchange, we, we need to address or understand blood as a tissue, which I often think about as the flow of people moving through turnstiles is the flow of gases between the air and the blood, between the alveoli and the capillaries. So here, this is the wrong slide. <laughs> okay. I had changed this. The first three are the ones that we've seen already. This fourth one should have two more points after it. I'll post the updated version. Do you have the updated version on Moodle? Or is it, yeah, maybe, okay. Anyways, we're going to uh, explore not only how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported, but how they move into the blood, <coughs> factors that affect their movement into the blood. Some things make it more likely that the exchange of gases will occur, some make it less likely. And then we'll consider the offloading of oxygen at the tissue. So we're focused on the lung as a starting point and we imagine the blood coursing through the rest of the body and what happens terminally to unload oxygen and deliver nutrients, etc., to the uh, distal tissues. So the blood as a tissue is really a liquid connective tissue. This is the, uh, the major circulatory tissue in the body. Cells don't really move very often. They don't really move at all. They rely on the provision of oxygen, the provision of nutrients to survive, to supply their normal function. If you were to take a sample of blood from you sitting there right now, it wouldn't look like this. You typically think of it as just a red liquid, fairly dark, almost opaque. Maybe it's bright red, maybe it's dark red, and it changes depending on um, how it's loaded. But if you were to spin or separate the elements in the blood, you could start to see these different layers appear. And the first layer is what makes the blood, it gives the, uh, the blood its red characteristic, are the red blood cells. And just under half of the sample that you would take out is made up of red blood cells. 45% in this case, could be 50%, usually no more than 55%, and that's probably artificial. It's really hard to manipulate it too far outside of this range. There are a couple other things, some other cells or formed elements that um, can be spun out of solution. And here we call them a buffy coat, which are all the things that are cellular or particulates that aren't red blood cells. And there's not a whole lot. At least they're not perceptible. Here, there's a small white layer that I think has been magnified so you can, you can observe or imagine what it would be like. But in practice, if you separate blood in a centrifuge, you don't really see that white layer. There might be a, a little frothy layer on top, but it's really hard to notice the white blood cells or any of the, uh, the platelets, any other constituent elements in there. It typically only separates into red blood cells and the rest is plasma. So together, the, the cellular components are called what, what the book refers to as formed components. Cellular components or formed elements of the blood. Things that can be spun out. And we will focus mostly on red blood cells. Those are the uh, important units in gas exchange. Not to say the other elements aren't important, 
They just don't play a large role in gas exchange. Red blood cells, most important elements in gas exchange. And the name for the amount of red blood cells in the blood is called hematocrit. So this 45% of the blood being red blood cells, I would say the hematocrit in this sample is 45%. Hematocrit is the label we give to the fraction of blood that is red blood cells. The rest, perhaps surprisingly, is just fluid and dissolved substances. It's largely water, 90% water, maybe even 95. The plasma is what suspends all of the other things in it. Largely water contains ions. This is where you would transport glucose. Glucose in the blood would be kept largely in the plasma, fat, cholesterol, chylomicrons, lipoproteins, all hosts of other things that are carried in the blood, hormones, would be in the plasma. <clears throat> so we have percentages in this sample. We know from the cardiovascular section there's roughly five liters of blood in a person. A little bit less for women, a little bit more for men, and the difference is really only body size. But about five liters on average per person. If 45% of that is red blood cells, then two and a quarter liters is red blood cells. That's a lot of red blood cells. Two and three quarter liters then is just empty plasma carrying those cells, hormones, and other elements. Now we could get into a lot of detail if we wanted to. The breakdown of not only that sample, but of all um, fluid compartments in the body as shown here, the entire body mass is over on the left-hand side. Blood is only a small fraction of that. And then we see the separation, like we saw on the last slide here, the formed elements being largely red blood cells with some other things sprinkled in. The plasma, which is the matrix that carries those formed elements, we are focusing mostly on red blood cells, the hematocrit, this box. All of these other elements, uh, we'll come back to when we talk about immunity later in the course. Uh, we've talked briefly about it when we talked about um, hormones last semester. We keep mentioning things like free fatty acids or glucose, etc. Those would all be carried in the plasma. This little box here contains electrolytes, a fancy buzzword we use to describe the things in sports drinks nowadays, sodium, potassium, magnesium, etc. Some gases are carried in the plasma. That might be a little confusing at first glance. I'm emphasizing that we're going to focus on red blood cells because those are the things that are, are important for gas exchange. But there is some very small capacity to dissolve gas in the plasma. A lot like you would dissolve CO2 in uh, soda, a soft drink. The bubbles in pop are dissolved gas. You can do that in plasma to some extent as well but only a very small fraction. And a host of other proteins up here with varying functions, but mostly to help hold on to some of the fluid. We're not going to get into too much depth with those other elements, like I said, focusing mostly on red blood cells. But altogether, it's important, I think, to realize the blood is more than just fluid and red blood cells. Now, the variety of cells allows for a variety of functions. It's not just a static tissue. It's a very active tissue. So it should be no surprise that transport is a major function of the blood. It moves readily. It is actively pumped by the heart. It moves through the vasculature. It comes in contact with uh, virtually all of the uh, 
the organs, the tissues, and the periphery. And so it transports uh, things in solution. Ions, fuel, nutrients, hormones. It removes waste products. We don't often think of that it transports heat as well. That we are warm-blooded is because the blood transports heat to all extremities of the body. This is what makes up our warm-bloodedness. So blood transports these elements. In doing so, it often regulates those elements too. It keeps them within normal limits or normal ranges. So uh, concentrations of ions, for instance. Because blood perfuses most tissues in the body, those concentrations are equalized across different regions of the body. Same thing with temperature. You're not really hot in one area versus another, or if you are, it's short-lived. The temperature gradually dissipates throughout the body because of the movement of blood. Not only the things that are dissolved in blood, but water moves in and out of blood all the time. If you are particularly dehydrated, if the muscle is contracting a lot and pushing fluid into different compartments, the blood can accommodate fluid or it can let out fluid if needed. Overall, the movement of blood and the ability to equalize tries to keep all of the components similar. All the components static or allow for homeostasis to be maintained. Similar temperatures, sim uh, similar concentrations. We don't want wild variations in one region of the body versus another. And then it also has this, uh, this ability, this role to protect against invading pathogens, the immune system, largely uh, evident in the blood. Uh, clotting, if the, the blood or um, the vasculature is open to the environment, we have this way of protecting uh, ourselves from losing fluid, losing proteins, losing ions, etc., from losing too much blood. <coughs> Protection, regulation, and transport, three major functions of the blood. So let's focus on our major, um, on, on the major candidates involved in gas exchange, the red blood cells. Red blood cells or erythrocytes, the scientific name for red blood cells. What is it about these cells that makes them good candidates for gas exchange? Why are we focusing on them in this discussion? The fact that they contain hemoglobin is largely the reason why we focus on red blood cells. Hemoglobin is the, the key protein involved in transport of gases, specifically the transport of oxygen and to a lesser extent the transport of CO2. Each of these is packed full of hemoglobin proteins. Hemoglobin protein doesn't just flow through the plasma. It's contained within the red blood cells, and that's why we focus on these cells specifically. Now, I'll show you what hemoglobin looks like, and you will go into more depth in this in biochemistry. But hemoglobin has this ability to ramp up its binding of oxygen. It has a number of sites to bind oxygen, it can open and close those sites. We can regulate it. It's really interesting to, uh, to consider how oxygen binds to hemoglobin. The iron at the center of a hemoglobin molecule, it's not so important now that we understand what it does or why it's important. You'll learn about how the charge changes and makes the, the sites open or close in biochemistry. But hemoglobin, the iron molecule, is central to the normal function of hemoglobin. And we'll leave it at that. Without the iron ion in the middle of the hemoglobin molecule, it wouldn't function properly. 
So for our purposes, we just need to know it's there. For individuals that are anemic, that have issues with iron metabolism, this is one reason why um, it's easier for them to get dizzy or faint or they're not able to uh, go to altitude easily. It's because hemoglobin specifically is compromised because of the low iron status. They're also shaped fairly uniquely. Not many other cells in the body are what we call a bioconcave disc. Concave, the, the divots that you can walk into, uh, one on either side. They're not a sphere like most other cells in the body. And this allows them to carry more oxygen, or at least move more oxygen, because they have a higher surface area to volume ratio. If they were just a big cell that contains a lot of stuff within that, that sphere, that circle, but it's really hard to move things in and out of it. With this flattened cell approach, there's a lot of surface area, a lot of opportunity to move gases. So a unique shape. So one red blood cell. One bioconcave disc, you see the concavity shown here as we section through the, uh, the red blood cell on the bottom half of this figure. We look at it face on uh, at the top, very, very small. And the constituent elements in the red blood cell that are important for gas exchange are hemoglobin, shown over here as this giant globular protein. And importantly, this was something that I didn't understand when, when I was first in undergrad, so I want to point it out here. Importantly, each red blood cell does not only have one hemoglobin molecule. You might want to superimpose this right on top. Each red blood cell is actually packed full of individual hemoglobin molecules. It's not just one to one. There are a lot of these proteins crammed into each red blood cell. So that's one, one important clarification to make as we move forward. So red blood cells contain a large complement, a large concentration of hemoglobin, and then each individual hemoglobin molecule is shown over here on the right-hand side. So we have about five liters of blood, just over two liters of red blood cells. If you were to break everything apart and then measure how much hemoglobin there is, there's 150-ish grams per liter. Take a liter of blood out of you, and there are 150 grams worth of these molecules. You could weigh that on a scale. Even though these are individually small, together they make up a large ability to carry gases, dissolve gases in the blood. So hemoglobin, where does it get its name? Hemoglobin. The two parts of that name indicate the major components of the molecule. Heme and globin. Globin are these uh, protein structures shown here. There are four of them in each hemoglobin molecule. They're generally portioned out into the corners of these molecules. So I'm showing you two alpha globins, and there are two complementary uh, beta globins within each hemoglobin molecule. And we don't care why they're called alpha or why they're called beta at this point. That's a detail that's uh, reserved for biochem. We just need to know there are four globin molecules. And if you're confused what it means to say these are polypeptide chains, it simply means they're proteins. A polypeptide chain means peptides that are attached together in one long chain, linked together in a chain. That makes a protein. That's the definition of a protein. So each of these is one protein, and they're bound together to make the hemoglobin molecule. So four globins, and at the center of each globin are the heme molecules proper. So the heme itself is the disc 
These look like little mini planets, little mini Saturns. The rings of these disks are the heme portion, and then the planet at the center, the little red dot, is the iron ion that we talked about that is crucial to the binding of oxygen. If these two things are not there together, heme doesn't work properly. We need the rings or the scaffolding. The scaffolding centers the iron ion in the middle, and the iron ion is what allows successful binding and release of oxygen. Without iron, we don't get that successful binding and release of oxygen. <coughs> so looking at this one molecule, we have the four globins, that seat heme right in the middle, there are four hemes and four globins. Each heme can bind one oxygen molecule. So four globins, four hemes, can bind in total four oxygen molecules. Now I don't know how, how many molecules there are in a liter of oxygen. I want to say molecules per gram is, isn't that Avogadro's number? But I forget what that is, like six times 10 to the 23. You remember that from chemistry, right? Something like that. I'm not sure how many per liter, but overall, each individual hemoglobin molecule doesn't carry a lot of oxygen. We'll put it that way. The combined effect of all of these molecules is what allows us to take in uh, measurable amounts of oxygen and consume it. But on a one-off basis, each one does not carry very much oxygen. So this is uh, the structure. These are the sites of oxygen binding. This is what we're talking about. Now, these are the major things packed within each red blood cell. Hemoglobin, the major stuff that fills each red blood cell. But there are other things. There are enzymes in a red blood cell. There's some glucose in red blood cells. Some nitric oxide is produced in red blood cells. We talked about this last section. It's a way that tissues can bring in or increase blood flow locally. Nitric oxide is one of those substances that dilates the arterioles. And red blood cells have that ability to release nitric oxide, to dilate, to increase blood flow locally. So red blood cells can produce nitric oxide to help increase vasodilation, to increase blood flow, and uh, oxygen delivery. They also contain, this isn't so important now, but you've seen this in lab already, an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, and I'm not showing you the equation yet. You've seen it, maybe it's familiar, but it's a way that we can uh, regulate pH and carry CO2. We're coming back to this later, but I want to introduce it here now. This enzyme is contained within the red blood cells and it allows us to regulate pH and help carry CO2 through the blood. So carbonic anhydrase we'll come back to, but it's a very special enzyme that helps us to uh, carry carbon dioxide. Notice it's specifically carbon dioxide and not <coughs> oxygen. So we will come back to that in a second. Not in a second, we'll come back to that on Thursday. So red blood cells packed with hemoglobin have some enzymes, can help vasodilate uh, some of the systemic circulation. They're not really long lived. They might last three or four months. We constantly recycle them. We use the constituent elements, we break them down, we reuse the iron, we reuse the amino acids. We break them down regularly by the, the spleen. That's its main, or one of its main jobs. The liver also, also helps to release some heme molecules to the bile ducts. 
We're constantly renewing and producing new red blood cells. So three or four months, all the components are reused, broken down by the spleen and the liver, but not produced by the spleen and the liver. If you remember way back to semester one, we know where red, red blood cells are produced. Not in the spleen and the liver, but in the marrow of the bones. In the red bone marrow. The process by which we make new red blood cells is, is really interesting. It's um, a concept we talk more about in performance enhancing substances. Is I think a second year course that you have. Um, I used to uh, teach it in fitness assessment. I don't know if that's still going on now, but it's one of the, the mechanisms that athletes try to leverage to help improve their sports performance. If you have more red blood cells, you can carry more oxygen. You can carry more oxygen, you can work out at a higher intensity. This is the basis of blood doping or EPO administration. EPO is erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is the hormone that initiates the production of red blood cells. And so some individuals will artificially administer EPO to produce more red blood cells than they would naturally. Which, of course, is unfair. Have you seen Icarus, by the way, on Netflix? Great documentary. Took a real left turn halfway through, but touches on this issue um, really nicely. So EPO generates or initiates red blood cells. We can do it artificially with a syringe, but it's meant to be turned on naturally in response to low oxygen. If you move to altitude and you live there for a while, that signal, not having enough oxygen in the blood, will turn on EPO, which makes sense. If your blood doesn't contain enough oxygen to supply the tissues, you want to increase the ability of your blood to contain oxygen. So low oxygen concentration will also stimulate EPO to make new red blood cells. But this is what we would call a more natural approach. This is also leveraged by athletes though. Um, sleeping in hypoxic tents or live high, train low tries to um, leverage this natural mechanism. Anyways, I'm getting off on a tangent. I find this really cool. We can talk about it later. EPO is what initiates red blood cell production. Um, so we produce them in red blood or in uh, the bone marrow, the red bone marrow. When they're not mature yet, they're called reticulocytes. A small distinction between uh, the, the stem cells and then the erythrocytes proper. And they mature in one to two days, and they're released and are fully functional in the blood, where they sit there for about three or four months, doing the job of transporting gas. So that entire life cycle that we just talked about, you can see on this schematic here. This is a busy diagram. It's a busy diagram, and I'm not going to go through each number. And unlike the Wiggers diagram, I'm not going to put this on and ask you what does number one or two mean when we talk about midterm two. There's too much information here. But the major points that we discussed are obvious. So the red bloods or the, the red bone marrow in the long bones over on the right-hand side is where we see erythropoiesis, the production of new erythrocytes, the production of new red blood cells. And they're released into the circulation where they spend three or four months transporting gas, buffering CO2 and buffering pH, maybe helping to vasodilate the arterioles. We don't know, but they do that in the uh, vasculature for three to four months. And when it's time for them to break down, we uh, deconstruct is a good word, I think. We deconstruct the red blood cells and the hemoglobin molecules. So globin itself is broken down. The alpha globin, the beta globin, those, those long curled proteins, 
We chop them up. We don't need those proteins, but we need the building blocks, the amino acids that make proteins. We release those to be reused in other parts of the body. So globin is deconstructed and broken down. That leaves heme and iron. Iron can be recycled. That iron at the center of the heme molecule has its own entire uh, metabolic pathway. We, we recycle it and we use it for the production of new red blood cells. And heme can be broken down and excreted um, either through the feces or the urine. Heme is excreted through the bile ducts and processed and uh, expelled from the body. We make heme anew in the production of new red blood cells in the long run. So we're comfortable with red blood cells, hemoglobin, and that they carry oxygen. I want to start on our next concept quickly because it's an important concept that underpins movement of gas. Gas exchange. I thought we could, we could break here, but I really want to introduce this next concept because I want you to think about it until Thursday when we come back. It's... Uh, it's a little bit of a departure from the normal way we think about pressure gradients or concentration gradients. So in the movement of gas, it's first important to consider what gases are moving and what pressures they're moving in accordance with. So blood moves from high blood pressure to low blood pressure. Air moves from high atmospheric pressure to low atmospheric pressure. But the individual gases don't move according to those exact same gradients. They move according to their own individual pressure gradients. And this phenomenon is uh, described by Dalton's law. So every gas has its own gradient. Every gas exerts its own pressure as if no other gases were present. So what do I mean by that? Let's take the air in this lecture hall. Room air. Any, any room on Earth at sea level has just a fraction of CO2. There's very little CO2. 0.03%. It's almost immeasurable. <coughs> It's perhaps surprising that the air in this room is mostly nitrogen. 79% of the air you're breathing right now is nitrogen. We don't really care about nitrogen unless you're scuba diving and then quickly moving to altitude. But we don't really care because it's what we call metabolically inert. It goes in and it comes out. And that's pretty much it. The rest of the air, if you don't account particulates and pollution, is oxygen. 20.97% oxygen, and this is remarkably stable. These fractions are consistent. They're consistent here. They're consistent in Ontario or BC. They're consistent even at altitude. The percentage of each of these individual gases in a sample is consistent. Now what I want you to think about is not the concentration or the percentage of the pressures. Now according to Dalton's law, each of these gases exerts its own pressure as if there are no other gases around. So when we talk about pressure, what, what are we talking about? If we're sitting here in this room and you were to measure barometric pressure, the entire pressure of air weighing down on your head, pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. So similar units to measuring blood pressure, 
It's then easy to understand if we have a gradient that gases can move. This is total air pressure. The pressure of all of the gases in this room. 760-ish millimeters of mercury. If you ever watched the Weather Channel, you've seen this as 101 kPa, kilopascals. Same thing, just different units. Now what Dalton's law says is that if this is the total pressure of air in this room, 79% of that pressure is due to nitrogen. 20.97% of that air, or sorry, of that pressure is due to oxygen. And 0.03% of that pressure is due to CO2. So if we know total atmospheric pressure, we can easily calculate the individual pressure of gases. So let's say I'm looking at CO2 and I'm interested at CO2. The pressure of CO2 in this room is 0.6 millimeters of mercury. That's simply 0.03% of 760. The pressure of nitrogen in this room, 600 millimeters of mercury. That's 79% of 760. And then the pressure of oxygen, 100 and we'll round it to 60, 159.4 millimeters of mercury. And breaking it down in this way is a really important concept. These individual pressures are what we call partial pressures. And it's the partial pressure gradient that dictates if a gas moves. The partial pressure gradient is the individual pressure exerted by one gas. And if oxygen moves into the blood, it's along its partial pressure gradient. So this is an important concept to be aware of and to understand. I'll leave it there. We'll recap this on Thursday. Have a wonderful Tuesday and Wednesday. I'll see you on Thursday.